I had asked uh, Jonathan to lead a song about he is able, and I changed my mind between there and here, and decided to go back and do one concerning the being pilgrims of the earth, and uh, I think you would have thought he chose that song to fit this sermon too, the one we just saw, because it certainly spoke out about our eternal home and the desire that we should have to be there. I've wondered over the years of the study of the Bible from time to time about Noah and his family as the ark was preparing and the time it took and the day-to-day effort while everybody else did as they pleased may have very well mocked him and ridiculed him, we don't know. But what he was doing was totally different from where the rest of the world was living. And there was only eight souls. They entered that ark. God shut them in. Only eight souls that were willing to follow the will of the Lord. And so as we come down through the stream of time and the revelation of God's word, we see that when, it, when people who are ser- servants of God compare to those who are not, they've always been few and far between. It's not any different nowadays. If you take all that we claim to be members of the Church of Christ, and if every congregation of God's people was everything the New Testament says they ought to be, still such a minority of all these people on this earth. But we are pilgrims and strangers here. Have you ever noticed, or maybe you haven't, if you've flown any or some other public transportation, they might have something said about this particular flight is in route. Well, I like to think about us. Uh, we haven't reached the destination yet. We certainly, we certainly lifted off the airport and are flying, but we're en route. Or if you'd prefer to call it en route, <laughs> as to where we're going. I think of the inspired writer of the Hebrews as we studied not long ago, saying in Hebrews eleven thirteen, which is in the midst of that great chapter on what it is to be faithful to God, an obedient faith. Concerning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it says they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now the idea of confessing means I realize something to be the case. It's genuine. It's actual. And that's the way it is. So even in that starlight period of the patriarchal age, under what law they had, it was clear to them that earth is not my permanent home. And they knew to get to that eternal home would be on the basis of their faithfulness to God. Most of us get involved in the things of this life to such an extent that we forget what I would call a basic premise that the world is not our home. Now, we have a song on that one too. The world is not our home. We're just passing through. How much better off we'd be in dealing with uh, matters of this life in making our plans and purposing We say, now I've got to remember, this is not my permanent dwelling place. And I don't know when I'm going to make the journey, the step over into eternity. We, if we're faithful or like Abraham and others, we're, we're just passing through. Our time and abilities and energies should be consumed in those things that are lasting, that are therefore meaningful in the journey that we find ourselves in, en route from earth to heaven. But too often we waste ourselves and time on the trivia of this life that we'll never, never see eternity. We need to remember what is said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? That is a tremendous question. People talking about things being relevant. Well, I don't know of any more relevant question than that. 
unless you just want to say, I don't have a soul. I'm totally materialistic. I'm here when I'm dead. I'm out of existence. There is, you know, God, the, the scripture says God has set eternity in the heart of man. The people who spend so much time and energy and learning to try to declare there is no God, the atheist. If there is no God, why are you so disturbed about it? Why are you so upset about it? If all these other people want to go and serve God and you don't believe He is, so what? That's their business. They'll, they'll learn when they die because they won't be. And that gets into a lot of things because you don't learn anything after you die if, you are, if you're not. So why is it that these who says, I know God does not exist, or I know that Christ is not the Son of God, or I know the Bible is not the Word of God, it's just a myth. Why are they so wrapped up in it from day to day, all day long? My personal view and view of the fact God sets eternity in the heart of man is that, that there is that eternal soul in them crying out to be satisfied. So what shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul, Jesus asked. Now all of us are en route somewhere and there's only two possible places to go, heaven or hell, and both of them are eternal. How we live here on this earth determines where we shall be. As one fellow said, how we live in the here and now determines where we will be in the there and then. <laughs> what is, what man is, what man is he? The psalmist said, that shall live and not see death, that shall deliver his soul from the power of Sheol. Psalm 89, 48. Most people, the great, great majority of people, do not like to think about death. And thus, they do all they can to shut it out of their minds. I think the Christian ought to be thinking about death all the time. Over the many years I've tried to preach the gospel as a young person in my teens all the way to this present time, I've tried to think about death. I don't think there's a day go by that I don't think about death. Whether it was 18 or at this stage of the game, anywhere in between. Because I knew the Word of God well enough to know that this life can end any moment and it will end. And even when you were a teenager in your 20s, there were plenty of people dying at that time, at that age. If nothing else, the Vietnam War was going strong. <laughs> plenty of people died every day. Besides all that died elsewhere. Now they entered into eternity, most of them not at all ready to enter in. Did he know what they were going to expect, to expect? However, the Christian surely knows what to expect. Nothing in the Bible tells us what to expect. Now, none of us, not a one of us, it's only normal to being a human in a fleshly body that's full of all kind of frailties, wants to go through the very process of dying. Some is very quick. Others it's drawn out. But the point is we're going to die. And death itself, the leaving of the spirit from the body, is just a journey. I remember in the eighth grade when I had my horse wreck, as I call it. My little horse decided she did not want to ride, so she reared up and fell on me. Process of uh, rearing, she threw her head back and hit me right square in the nose. And if you look at my nose now, you'll still see a wishbone cut there because it mashed it flat and cut it in two. It took... Uh, surgery and all to get it straight. In other words, my nose is not what it was before she got a hold of it. <laughs> Although it looks better now after I had surgery on it than it did when it, when it healed and she left it alone. And you've, you've never experienced anything until a month or so after it's all healed. You see something on your nose and you get a hold of the tweezers and it's horse hair coming out. But it knocked me cold as a wedge, as we want to say, if you... Maybe I shouldn't use wedge. People know what a wedge is, but this knocked me completely out and hit me so hard. 
I can't even remember where we've been riding that afternoon. The only reason I remember where we or know where we rode is because that's where we always rode. I can hardly remember anything that went on just before it. And I stayed knocked out all night long. Woke up in the morning, I was fresh as a daisy as far as my mind was concerned. Some people would say it did a lot more harm than you realize. The, but <laughs> it may have. <laughs> but I thought about that even then. I thought, well, now if she had just uh, killed me outright then, I wouldn't have been bad at all. I just went out of it because there was no pain. I was just gone completely out of it, been blacked out, and uh, opened my eyes eternity, so to speak. So why do we worry about things? part of what we need to overcome in demonstrating our faith in God and His care for us. It's an exercise in becoming spiritual. But the living know that they shall die, Ecclesiastes 9 and verse number 5. Now this could be said 50 years ago, 100 years ago, back when Paul lived and so on. Because look around you. Especially if you're in Houston, everybody's hurrying. They're all in a hurry. You don't talk to anybody. Says, "Well, I'm headed here. I can't do that right now. I, I'm headed here. I got to get this done. I got this appointment here. This and it's, uh, it doesn't matter where you live or when you live. It doesn't matter really what you do. The pace is that of a race. Question: Why? The wise man inspired of the Spirit of God wrote, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and the vexation of the Spirit. He's asked these one in verse 14. Now you've got to realize the point of view that he's taking. If God is not in your plans, if living for God is not in your plans and in your efforts, then what is there that's abiding, that's worth anything? The atheist can't really deal with that because he has to admit the moment I die, I cease to be. Whatever good I've done, whoop, how do I determine what's good? Can't even talk about good. How can I determine what's bad? If you press him on those things, he has a hard time. So he just ceases to be. We work hard and long at difficult jobs, just many, most people do, just trying to get ahead and live in paycheck to paycheck and so forth. So it's easy to become materialistic and to try to get gain and as much as you can. Yet we know the Bible's full of material that says, while I put you here on this earth, God speaking, I've given you a way to live, the things that you need in the fleshly body. And uh, thus I address those things. And thus there's a certain amount you ought to put into earning your living, so to speak. But when you read Ecclesiastes 5.10, it gets rather interesting. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Nor he that loveth abundance with increase. And then he ends it. This is also Vanity Again, that's Ecclesiastes 5.10. We are in such a big hurry that we're getting all sorts of things and none of those things of a material nature actually satisfies us. We would say satisfy that inner need, which means the spirit that we talked about a moment ago, that God fathered and is in us. As the writer of Hebrews says, He is the Father of spirits. We dream and we plan, and we speak of tomorrow, and we talk about what tomorrow will bring. And even the conversation we have like that speaks of our being pilgrims and strangers on this earth. We're just traveling through this world. And I don't believe it's wrong, necessarily, to dream and to plan. It's the very nature of this world. You've got to do some of it. But a Christian does it always with the idea that I may never see tomorrow. And whatever plans and purposes I've got must fit into living according to the will of God. So we're doomed if we live and make our plans and purposes and all that without taking consideration the things of God and how they should come first. James addressed that to brethren 
2,000 years ago. They had the same problems. Now, these are brethren. They're not outside of the church. They're Christians. Come now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into this city and spend a year there and trade and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. What is your life? Well, you're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanisheth away. Then here's this conclusion. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall both live and do this or that. James 4, 13 and 14. There is a fundamental weakness in any journey that leaves God out of it. So he, it's obvious here he's not saying you can't plan for tomorrow, you can't purpose to do something this afternoon, but you're always conscious of the fact that you are here temporarily. You're just passing through. You're a stranger to the ways of this world. Heaven's your home. Your mind's set on things above. You're striving to fashion your thoughts and actions after the teaching of the Christ. You're wanting to hold on those things and tenaciously hold on to them, steadfastly hold on to them, because they will transcend this life and all things material and fleshly. And God's faithful have always been pilgrims. I want to go back to Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, concerning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we call, the Holy Spirit does, Abraham the father of the faithful. Well, listen to this from verses 13 through 16, chapter 11 of Hebrews. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, meaning the promise of the coming gospel and gospel of the church and so forth, having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things make it manifest that they are seeking after a country of their own. We like to speak of this country. This is my country. My country, it is of thee, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it is in a sense. But it's just for a little while in the sense of anything that is material, that is fleshly. But then when you go down a little further, but now they desire a better country. Think about it for a minute. You want a better country if you're a faithful child of God than what the United States offers or ever could offer or ever did offer. But now they desire a better country. Notice he says that is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed of them to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city. So we ought to be thinking about eternity. We ought to be thinking about how transient we, things are here, how temporary, how we're pilgrims, how we're strangers to this world. Now we've all made journeys, some more lengthy than others. But we have that place on earth we call home. Many poems have been written about home. Songs have been written about home because there is that disposition of mind and emotions that connect to home. Even a song called Home Sweet Home. But really, they help us understand what the eternal home is. I often think of where I grew up in Camden, Arkansas, home and gone so long, everybody's died and so many people aren't even there. Things aren't like they were. If I went back there to live, it would just be the topography I'd see. I, hardly anybody else is there that I would have known. And so a fellow back in the 19th century wrote the poem, You Can't Go Back Home. And you can't. So whatever home you've got here, it, it's, it's going to end. But not the eternal home. So why should we think about death? It's the doorway to our eternal home. The world, with all of its ambitions and schemes, does not capture, override, and control the minds of God's faithful. The Apostle Peter exhorts us 
as we have studied, 2 Peter 2 and verse 11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. Why? Which war against the soul. So our journey through life is one of biblical faith, love as the Bible defines it and practice, tells us to practice it, of service to God through serving others as he defines that service, and the expectation of glory. There's something wrong with a Christian that doesn't think about home. You have somebody in the military, especially they were drafted when that was going on, and they go to counting the days before they're let loose. They get it down to the hours. I'll be discharged. And they think about it. What are you going to do when you get out? Or you got school. And you think about graduation. Everybody has all sorts of conniptions over graduation. All right, fine, it's accomplishment, whether it's high school or college or advanced degrees. But what, what a thought to enter into glory, which is beyond our minds to understand, except as we understand the Bible talking about it. If we're pilgrims, and we are, then our journey will ultimately end somewhere. And the question we need to ask, what's my destination? I'm en route. Where's it going to end? Let me mention a few things before we close the lesson. Because we need to determine our final destination. Because it's coming. Here's one. To what do you give your time? This is going to be the case till the end of time. And has been going all the way back. You talk to anybody and you talk about doing something. I don't have time. I'll see if I have, if I have the time. You know, you'll never hear that in eternity. <laughs> It'll never be there. Time won't be anymore. Do I have the time? Do I have the time to save my soul? Which means do I have time to study the Bible? Which means do I have the time to be honest with myself? Do I have the time to look and see how God says I ought to live this life? Putting together three passages from the New Testament, Ephesians 5.16, Hebrews 3.15, 2 Corinthians 6.2, here's what we have. He speaks of redeeming the time because the days are evil. Then he says, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And then we conclude with, behold, now is the accepted time. You're not a Christian. Now's the time to become one. If you put it off, it's only because of God's favor He's allowed you to come now. He's not obligated to give you to when you get ready to obey the gospel, however many days in the future that might will be, if there is a future. Say, so, all right. No, when you hear the gospel, it's time to obey it. Time, time to obey it. Then another one is to determining where we're headed. Another question, what do you think most about? What occupies your mind? Throughout the day, what occupies your mind? If we're physically, if we are physically, what we eat, then it is true spiritually, we are what we think. Proverbs 23 and verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And this is the reason that our Lord himself exhorts us, whatsoever things, through the pen of Paul to Philippians, whatsoever things are true, then he says, uh, just, honest, pure, lovely, of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4, 8. Now let me give you a pointer if you haven't noticed it. Throughout the day, the way things are and places you go and what you do and what you associate with, it is difficult to keep your mind on those things because the world certainly doesn't, doesn't have it out there. Uh, these kind of things do not make news nor make good TV programming nor movies. It's right the opposite. When we fill our minds with trashy filth resulting in all sorts of things, whether we get it out of a book or however it is, and we're thinking about those things, it's going to be seen in our life. 
It isn't difficult to know the direction of your life when you look honestly at your own thoughts, purposes, and plans. Well, another one is, and this will be point three, what are you willing, for what are you willing to die? Of course, we think automatically that this country was born because so many thousands were willing to give their lives for this country. I think of those approximately, what was it, 186 men who died at the Alamo. That not only is a great thing with Texans, but it goes throughout the country as a symbol of sacrifice to have freedom. But I don't know whether any of those people are ready to meet their maker. But when it comes to sacrificing to serve God in the church as a faithful child of God, to die for the Lord is tantamount to saying, I'll be faithful, give me liberty, give me death. So we do see and understand sacrifice of all those that died in World War II, World War I, and so on. But we understand to be a Christian in the army of the Lord, the Lord's church, to be a member of his family, no man can serve two masters. You've got to make up your mind. You're either totally given to the Lord and learning his word and living it, or you're going to be somewhere else. You won't be in between. You may say, well, I'm doing both. No, you're not. You're either on one side or the other. And Jesus said, but seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. Our problem with that verse I said many times is not in our inability to understand it. It's our inability to apply it. Matthew 6, 24 and 33. We're to seek after a better country as did Abraham. So where's our loyalty? Where's our spiritual patriotism? Paul said it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. But Christ lives in me. Then he said, I am ready not only to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20 and Acts 21.13. So Paul was willing to give his life for Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because eternity is where he was headed and he wanted to be in heaven in eternity. Because once you get there, that's where you are. But you don't accidentally get to heaven. You make deliberate choices. And that involves sacrifices of the fleshly and the material, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You choose not to live that way. You don't let the affairs of this present world govern you. You may want to. It may appeal to you. Yes, any temptation appeals to us. Make no excuses for that. When we're tempted to sin, it's because they're pleasurable in some way or the other, to one extent or the other. Nobody denies that. The best thing to do is say, yes, I'd like to do that too, but I won't. That's not any different than Christ in the garden. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. What was his will? Let this cup pass from me. Not my will but thine be done. Then for what do you spend your money? Oh, now we quit preaching and going to meddle it. Always. Always. Money will measure what you are. It's uh, shown what people are in families. If somebody dies and got money, you'll find out rather quickly um, how people are really are. And you find out a great many of them are terribly covetous. But Jesus said, Matthew 6, 21, where thy treasure is, there will thy heart be also. Then he tells us uh, in living the Christian life, those who are minded to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, 1 Timothy 6, 9. Notice minded, the mind, the thoughts, the plans, the purposes took place before the action, minded to be rich. Jesus told one like that in Luke 12, 15 through 21, what he needed to hear. And in what he said, it was too late for the man because you remember the rich farmer who prospered greatly. And he said, I will uh, pull down my barns. I got so much. And I'll build greater barns that I will say to my soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And the inflation comes along, and down goes IRAs. But 
five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. That won't bother you so much if you knew when you died you were leaving it all anyway. Well, this man's death came that night. I always think of the words the Lord said who knew his heart. Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. And then who shall all these things be? So we need to be mindful of what we use our money for. We need to understand how we involve that in seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then this one, to whom do you turn in time of trouble? To the faithful child of God, you're going to be turning the same one you turn to all day long every day when things are good or mediocre or whatever. In heaven, we find our hopes and aspirations. That's our destination. Then we'll turn to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need, Hebrews 4.16. And the promise of our Lord is very plainly stated. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Hebrews 13.5. They say, all right, he does that. He's invisible. I don't, I don't have to know. I know he controls all things. And he's especially and particularly concerned about his children living the Christian life and what they undergo. Because he says, as Peter did, as we studied not long ago in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares on him. Now this is going to try your faith. For he cares for you. Sometimes I hear people say nobody cares. Nobody cares. Paul even said, Concerning his first imprisonment, they all forsook me. But he knew one that would not forsake him. He's talking about human beings. Humans may not stand with you, but Jesus will. You cannot live the Christian life and do the things of God if you don't have this kind of trust that Jesus is with me. He's always with me. When I've traveled hither and yon in the world or wherever I've gone, there's always been that pleasant, comforting, peaceful thought, God is with me. I had a right to believe that and still do because of what God's good word says. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So when your destination is heaven, isn't that, way we'd say it here on earth, the natural place to turn? But for those geared to this world, they may not even say, as I see sometimes depicted on shows going way back, movies, well, Lord, I haven't talked to you too much lately. I don't know quite how to approach you. Well, he's not going to hear you now either. You know, you're there. And I'll call you when I need you. Most of them don't need you. You remember uh, the movie Shenandoah back in the 60s. James Stewart was in it. He'd sit at the table and offer, supposedly, a prayer for food. Oh, Lord, we... Broke this land and we sowed this and we reaped it all, but we'll thank you anyway. Yes, we're pilgrims on the earth. And each one of us, each one of us determines what our final destination will be. And we better look carefully in the direction we want to go. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. And that's the way it ought to end and begin and begin and end. If you're not a child of God this morning, we beg of you to believe with all your heart on the basis of the truth of God's word that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that you will obey the command to repent, Acts 17, 30, and to confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, Romans 10, verse 10, and to complete your obedience to the gospel by being buried with Him in baptism, Romans 6, 3 and 4, to obtain the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. To be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. To rise up a new creature in Christ, to serve Him, and to set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. And then someday, life's little day will be over. All things material, all things pertaining to time and space will fade into the past and be nothing. 
For there shall loom before us a marvelous eternity for the faithful, with the glory that God has for us. But what about the myriad who do not choose to serve God here? There will still be that vast eternity looming before them, unending. But it will not be a place of anything described as pleasant. So if you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. As a child of God, are you faithful like you know you ought to be? Are you letting sin in your life keep you from doing all you can do? God's not expecting of you what you can't do. He just wants you to do what you can you need to repent of any of those sins we invite you to come confessing them and praying god for forgiveness and do it now while we stand while we sing